So the title of my talk today is Megaliths in the Movies, The Power of the Past in Popular Culture. During this, I'm going to be looking at various cultural artifacts from decades gone by, movies, TV shows, which feature megaliths in the narratives, uh, looking at how they contribute to the story, um, how they're portrayed and interpreted in these narratives, uh, what, if any, patterns might emerge, and if there's any messages or lessons in there about our culture, in particular in how the past relates to the present and indeed to the future. Now, the particular magnetism for me about megaliths is how they connect us to the deep past, to prehistory, to a time in the history of our civilization about which we can say very little. Indeed, the further we go back in time, um, obviously the less we can say. There's kind of a, if you like, event horizon beyond which we cannot really see. And that's always fascinated me. And in terms of human history, um, the periods in time about which, which we can say the least are the ones that tend to interest me the most. Now here we've got a famous painting, The Flood Recedes, part of a series concerning biblical uh, mythology and narratives. And obviously the, this is, represents the, the aftermath of the biblical flood. Now, all over the world, all cultures have flood myths, telling of some relatively rapid or perhaps quite slow inundation of the world by waters, flood waters rising, as I say, varying rates of speed, but ultimately always catastrophic in impact. And the deluge myths, again, are representative of this idea that summed up in catastrophism. The idea that something really bad, more than once, but certainly something very, very bad happened in the history of our species that brought it to the brink of extinction. But somehow we emerged from the other side and it is the time before the catastrophe for me that the megaliths link us to because it seems that their origins extend into the deep dark past of human origins overall. These disasters can be naturally occurring, man-made, they can be earth-driven, perhaps off-planet. There's evidence of all of these sorts of catastrophes happening not only to the human race, but to other species, other periods of time in Earth's deep history. So, now I love this graphic. This is another representation of what I'm kind of talking about. The captions, by the way, at the side are mine. If we look at the bottom panel, we have the modern era. There's an image maybe of the, uh, the Earth a couple of thousand years ago. People going about uh, their business, uh, surrounded by the artifacts and evidence of a previous lost civilization. The people of that time know that these uh, remnants are significant, but they don't really understand them. They just knew that to their ancient ancestors, they were very, very important. And they imbue them, you know, each generation, each culture, each civilization imbues the artifacts of the past with some kind of meaning, quite often superimposing some of their own onto it in the same way, for example, that a lot of megalithic sites uh, and later significant religious sites had Christian and other Abra Abrahamic religions uh, built their sacred buildings on those sites. Because again, they knew they were significant, significant energetically. And this will this will be really, really key to what I'm talking about today. <clears throat> now, if we move to the middle panel, here is a representation of that kind of event horizon I was talking about. We do know about human history prior to the Ice Age, but it's hazy. And we know that the Ice Age uh, would seem to be naturally occurring. The climate changes all the time uh, on this planet. And that represented a sort of a rolling slow motion, if not a catastrophe, then certainly a, a very challenging time for our species. And we were lucky to make it through. And in that time, again, we see the remnants of a, a, a more advanced past civilization. Uh, and we're living among them, but perhaps their meaning has already become lost and they are no longer being used in the way that they once were. The idea represented here in this continuation of images is very important as well. That is that progress is not linear. It does not extend from primitive in the past through to advanced now in the present and even more advanced in the future. 
the arc of civilization and the human story is not like that. It is um, a step up and step down process of golden ages, dark ages, and everything in between. I think all of our mythology tells us this, but our modern materialistic scientific uh, view of reality runs counter to that because that narrative, in that narrative, the only way is up. And then we move to the top panel and Atlantis there, again, is just a metaphor. I don't mean that Atlantis itself you know, was, was, was not real, but Atlantis is a, a placeholder, a byword for the idea of a very advanced civilization in high antiquity, possibly with skills, knowledge, technology that we do not have now. We have our own forms of advanced technology, but whatever it is that we can do that some of our ancestors could not, it is clear that beyond that this event horizon, beyond some of these catastrophes, there were humans on this planet that could do things that we still do not understand. We don't understand why they did them, and in particular, how they did them. And again, this is something that we'll come to throughout the talk. This is what I think we're looking at, essentially, in, in many of these megalithic sites. Um, I'm just trying to boil it down here. We're looking at, as I see it, a form of energy technology. Take that as one phrase, take it as two separate words. These are energetically significant sites. The stones themselves have energetic properties. It is, represents a form of technology, not only the technology that, that, that built these things, but the, how they function themselves as machines, if you will, in their own way, energy technology. Second phrase here, spiritual science. They represent a, a time. They link us back to a time in our history when spirituality and science were not separate things. It was one totality, one unified whole. That is something that we have moved away from to our detriment. I think that our future lies in moving back to that. And then this is another theme that will come up again and again. One unified system, you affect one part of the system, you affect another. So we're looking at energy technology, we're looking at science and spirituality, working in tandem as two sides of the same coin. Primordial forces, talking about the deep dark past, there are energies at play and at work on this planet and off this planet that affect us profoundly, always have, and that we interact with that we do not understand. Maybe never will, but we like to pretend in the modern era that we have all of that more or less ticked off as uh, understood or shortly will anytime now, thanks to science and technology. So primordial forces are represented in these sites, in these stones, and in and other uh, megalithic artifacts. Secondly here, time and space. As I see it, time and space are not fundamental. They are not some kind of scaffolding upon which reality hangs. They are within, they are embedded within a wider reality. And this is why they are malleable. They themselves don't control everything, but they are controllable within this wider reality. And I think these megalithic sites represent nodes of malleability, places that are significant in terms of conjunction of time and space, where these forces, where these dimensions are open to manipulation, whether by ourselves, physically or uh, psychically, or by other forces and entities, either off planet or on it. And again, I think these are ideas that have long been, always been part uh, of life on Earth, but just became lost, misunderstood, and mistranslated down the eons. And again, in the modern era, are dismissed as insignificant. I don't mean that there's not lots of research going on, scientific research, with regard to the nature of time and space, but the idea that we somehow physically and psychically, psychically interact and control any of these dimensions is obviously dismissed out of hand. Okay, so the first item we turn to here, Night of the Demon. This is a British horror film from 1957. Uh, this is what I would call uh, an occult thriller, uh, very much in the vein of The Devil Rides Out, adapted from the Dennis Wheatley novel. Uh, you can see there on the cover, down the bottom section, uh, Stonehenge, this indicates that the megalithic site is to play a key role in the story. Now, 
This story concerns an American psychologist who travels to England to investigate the death of a colleague who has died under mysterious circumstances, um, according to police and official investigation due to an accident. And indeed, an accident did occur. But the big question is, what caused this chain of events? The British psychologist who was killed had been investigating a satanic cult. And he had threatened to expose the leader of the cult um, as a charlatan, as a fraud. This, this British psychologist and his American colleague are professional skeptics, basically. And indeed, the conference taking place is what you would call a debunkers conference there to poo-poo psychic phenomena and all sorts of uh, related matters. That's their stock in trade. This is an age, actually, that I th like to think that we're moving into um, the apocalypse of the skeptics because it's becoming harder and harder to dismiss non-material phenomena that, as I've said already, I've always been here, always part of this reality, um, but the, of which we've lost our understanding and our, our innate knowledge and in a scientific materialist worldview cannot exist because all that apparently exists is the world of three dimensions and five senses. On the left here, we see the American psychologist. Uh, on the right is the niece of the British psychologist who died in mysterious circumstances. Now, although this American is completely unconvinced that this satanic cult could have any kind of magical power, uh, simply believes that his colleague was um, was you know murdered and say you know the the so-called accident was brought about deliberately, uh, but nonetheless he sets about to investigate. He's in the country for the conference anyway, so he's already in debunking mode. Now here we meet the leader of said satanic cult. He reacted very badly to the British psychologist's threat to expose him and. Um, Regardless of what any of the protagonists think about this guy and his shadowy organization, the simple material fact is, as we can see from his surroundings, he's living high on the hog uh, with a lot of his acolytes and followers paying him considerable sums of money. So the American psychologist goes to visit him and begins to get a feeling that uh, whatever his views about magical powers or satanic cults or any of the rest of it, there's something deeper going on here simply beyond the surface. And the bottom line is that his British colleague and others have met their death and this guy is somehow, in some way, involved and they have to get to the bottom of it. In the film... They fall prey to this, the demon of the night, on the night of the demon. Uh, here we see, by the way, the satanic cult leader in one of his erstwhile guises as a stage magician. A uh, little scene here, he's uh, having just a Halloween party for the children. He says, just a Halloween party for the children. Keep that phrase in mind, because we'll be coming back to both Halloween and children later on. And in fact, there's a sort of subcurrent to some of the general themes that I'm looking at here involving the relationship with children and psychic phenomena, children and magical powers, children and non-material forces, and how our relationship with them psychologically changes as we move through different stages of life and our own psychological development. So the American psychologist, as he's beginning to investigate what's going on, he realizes that he needs to at least look at these satanic cult members on their own terms. So he begins to look at some of the texts that are referenced and some of the things that are cited. And he finds himself at the British Library doing research. And the caption here refers to a book that he's seeking that goes missing from the library. And our satanic cult leader offers to show him his copy if he would just visit him at his mansion. This idea will come up again in the talk, and it's the idea of books themselves being magical artifacts, be, being imbued with power, like the stones being imbued with some kind of energy. And in some of these fictional narratives, we have this recurring idea, not only of books going missing, but books turning up in 
other times and places that they shouldn't be in, sort of they're, they're teleporting basically, traveling in space and time. The contents of books changing over time, what was once in a book is not the same as what is now in the book, is not the same as what might be in the book in future. So the books themselves as energetic, magical artifacts. Now, here's our American psychologist again. He discovers that he has been hexed. He has been cursed. He has been chosen by this satanic cult leader. Again, he still doesn't believe it for a minute. But while he was visiting with him, the cult leader has managed to pass on to him a piece of parchment upon which are some runic symbols. This is the curse. And the key here is that he accepted it willingly. That's the nub of how this works. In terms of magic, he accepted this parchment willingly. He didn't know he was doing it at the time, not consciously, but nor did he say, I'm not having that. Uh, you know, I hold my hands up. I will not accept what you're giving me. So he travels, does some research, and he travels, as you can see here, to Stonehenge to look at some runes there uh, to compare them and try and understand, okay, I, I still don't believe any of this that has any power. But again, I'm researching this on the terms of these people. What do these symbols mean? What this is, the inclusion of Stonehenge and Megalus in general, in a er quite early film like this, it's a byword, it's shorthand for taking these types of things here, magic, mythology, witchcraft, paganism, druidry. These are just some terms I've pulled together that are symbolic of, of wider ideas. And they're equating them with unscientific mumbo jumbo. It's a modern scientific society's way of saying all of this stuff from the past, it's all, you know, we've transcended that. And we're showing here in this film, even though apparently there is something to this magical dimension, but ultimately the narrative of the film, you know, the overarching message is that this is all nonsense from the past, from humanity's distant, primitive past. And we have moved beyond that. And this will be proven to be the case. And even if there is a story like this, you know, a horror story uh, where people come to a sticky end at the hands of mysterious forces, at the end of the day, end credits roll. It was just a movie. So here he is comparing the runes on his piece of parchment, on his curse, with those on the stones, which of course are not there in real life. And he determines at this point, okay, so there is something to this in some way. And if these people, if they believe this, apparently as they do, he becomes increasingly convinced about this, then what does that mean? What, you know, how do I respond to this? As the film progresses, a little bit, once again, like in The Devil Rides Out, things start to take on an increasingly fast pace and there's a sort of cat and mouse chase. And this psychologist guy realizes, okay, I need to return this parchment to this cult leader. I need to give the curse back. And so he uh, pursues the cult leader who has left London to, uh, because, of course, he believes all this. He's trying to get away from the scene of his crimes uh, so that this curse cannot be returned to him. Our psychologist friend here pursues him on the train, eventually catches up with him and manages to pass the parchment back to him. And so there was another victim of the demon of the night on the night of the demon. So my idea is to take away here, across the ages, unseen forces, mind and matter, the old ways, the powers we're talking about, the primordial forces have always been here, will always be here. There's something eternal about them. Remember what I said about time and space? So across all the eons of human history, these things have been sometimes unseen, unmanifest, but they're always here, at the very least in the background. Mind and matter. Remember what I said about time and space once again? Mind and matter is a continuum, not two different states. The narrative here in the film is demonstrating the link between mind and matter, between will and manifestation. And then the old ways, what I referred to earlier as all that superstitious bunk. The old ways may be old, but they don't go away. They're not just supplanted by new ways. There are certain things that, that are fundamental, if not time and space, if not even mind and matter. There are certain things that are fundamental that do not go away. They're always with us. So look out for some of these points again as we move through this.
Other things to take away here, themes to look for, okay? Look at the imagery here. As we move through this, we're looking for circles and symbols and circles of symbols. Energy and force connected with circles and symbols. Energy and force, of course, in physics, not the same thing. Circles, symbols, energy, force. Keep looking. Okay, so on to our next item. Here we have Psychomania, film from 1973. It's a British film, uh, best described as a black magic biker film. Might actually be unique uh, of its kind. Okay, it involves the bike gang, the Living Dead. There they are, roaring across the countryside. Okay, so here we see the gang at a local stone circle named the Seven Witches. Uh, this is a place that they like to hang out, and this will be very significant to our story as we move through it. What is Psychomania? That's my characterization here. Black magic and bad boy bikers, a suicide ride to the other side. Okay, now the leader of this bike gang has an interest in all things occult and magical, as does his mother. Uh, she, this is where he gets it from, basically. And he undergoes a profound experience when he enters a locked room at his mother's house. A profound, supernatural, paranormal, magical experience. As a result, at the age of 18, he commits suicide. His mother brings him back from the dead via a ritual. And once back from the dead, he is one of the undead, cannot again be killed. So, and he has supernatural powers as a result. Now, he encourages, he realizes the potential in all of this for mayhem. So he encourages the rest of the gang to follow his path, to commit suicide, and then to be brought back as the undead. Now, all but one of the gang do this. There's one refuse Nick, one hold out. And uh, she becomes significant once again towards the end of the story. Once the gang have become the living dead, literally, they run amok. All of their previous behavior pales by comparison, and they set about terrorizing the local community. This is a small town community with lots of rural locations as well. So they end up terrorizing things like pubs and shopping malls, a uh, quite small town. But yeah, pubs and shopping malls. You think as the undead, they would think bigger, uh, but they didn't. This escalates into murder. Here they are riding roughshod across the countryside in their localized reign of terror. So I couldn't resist this one. Viewers of a certain age, uh, familiar with uh, British TV and children's TV shows, might get this one. Eventually, his mother becomes disgusted, actually, with her son and the gang's behavior. And she decides that he has, she has to undo this magical ritual that has been done, that has brought them back from the dead and given them this power. And so she enacts another ritual. And in doing so, she literally turns the gang to stone. Seven suicides seven witches and the members of the gang become new standing stones they become petrified this is a theme that's going to come up more than once as we move through all this the idea that the stones were once living beings that the stones have life within them or maybe that the stones can somehow come alive it's quite a circular situation but as i say just listen out for this again as we look at some other items okay next up sky from 1975 this show um made basically for children it's astounding really how many shows in the 60s and 70s that were aimed at uh, children or you know young adults teenagers that today uh, one cannot imagine being made uh, for such an audience uh this is one of the one of the best of its kind and in terms of concepts and ideas uh, really in the writing here um, it, it's it's outstanding, and again, it was just amazing that uh, such a young audience, such young minds were presented 
uh, you know, with, with concepts this um, mind-bending, really. So here's the titular character, Sky. Um, he arrives from some other place, some other time, we know not where. He just literally shows up in this rural location where the show is set. And again, you'll notice how often the word rural will be said um, as I move through this. It comes up time and time again. Uh, you know, of course, a lot of megalithic sites are, I mean, located rurally, and they, they could have been overbuilt, and some, no doubt, have been. But so many of those still extant today are in rural locations. And it does seem that in the megalithic era, in millennia gone by, that these sites were not located close to where the people who constructed them lived. They lived elsewhere, quite often uh, very far away. So Sky arrives in the midst of this community, and they are obviously fascinated by this character. Who is he? Where has he come from? What does he want? And he equally is trying to come to terms with where he finds himself in time and space. Now, as this process of mutual understanding uh, or misunderstanding begins, Sky begins to speak about what he knows, and he speaks about time travelers. And once he begins to learn more about his uh, this time that he finds himself in, he starts to use some terms to try and help the locals understand. So these time travelers, he says, you, you might call them gods. You have called them gods. And they have tried in the past to help the people of Earth. Uh, this should ring a lot of bells when we think about, you know, ancient alien ideas, about uh, intervention from other dimensions and also from off world. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. Sky begins to realize what's happened to him. He's arrived uh, in the wrong time, in the wrong place, and he needs to be somewhere else. He looks at the earth as it is in this time, and he speaks about the future that is coming. He talks about the chaos. He says, the ca chaos is coming for you people. Chaos is coming for your civilization. Where he needs to be, where he was trying to get to, was beyond the chaos, the other side of the chaos. His mission is to try and help humanity adapt in, in the aftermath of the chaos. And so he realizes that he has to escape this current place and time he finds himself in and get to the other side of the chaos. And he begins to talk to the people about what he's looking for. He begins to study books, diagrams, he looks at information that's available to him about history, about uh, the current society he finds himself in, technology, and starts to try and articulate what it is that he needs to find. And he speaks of a circle of force. What did I mention earlier about, about circles, about force? And what do we have in some of these megalithic sites, the stone circles? Circles, I believe, of force and of energy. He also speaks, fascinatingly, of an atom smasher. Here we see the inside of the Hadron Collider at CERN. What is this? Consider this in comparison to what we've just been looking at. What is this if not a circle of force? And it's fascinating, I think, to consider current developments in science and probing for the deeper nature of reality that is carrying on at CERN and what Sky finds himself talking about. This, look at this, the biggest machine ever constructed by the human race in order to attempt to achieve or at least take some baby steps towards something I believe that is innate within us. Abilities that we already have but the understanding, the knowledge of, the belief in that we have lost. Now, at this point in the story, this character on the right here emerges. This character's name is Goodchild. It turns out he is a physical manifestation as a human being of the earth energies of what you might call the spirit of Gaia. And the story gets very interesting at this point because you're wondering who's a good guy, who's a bad guy in all of this. Sky, good child. A good child looks like a typical movie villain there, doesn't he, with his black cloak. 
And he pursues Sky the way that your immune system immune system would pursue, would hunt down a virus. He identifies Sky as a threat to the Earth as is. And initially you're thinking, oh, good child is evil. Sky is trying to do good. But Sky himself, being very much a sort of David Bowie man who fell to Earth type persona, isn't really very likable. He's actually very robotic and aloof and, and literally alien. So an interesting dynamic comes into play. Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Who should we be rooting for? So Sky also speaks of seeking the juggernaut. This is something that comes up again and again. He talks about the circle of force. He speaks of an atom smasher. He seeks the juggernaut. What is the juggernaut? Here we have it. The juggernaut. A crossover point in time. Remember what I said about these sites, the megalithic sites, and the manipulation of time and space. And so, Sky is eventually able to get himself to the other side of the chaos, and we get a vision of a future Earth, a future human race, living a much simplified lifestyle, because it's made clear that the chaos was the result of our use or misuse of technology. Think back to earlier when we were considering the civilizations in high antiquity, the advanced civilizations, those talked about, such as Lemuria, Atlantis. Myths tell us that their undoing was the misuse of technology. So, interestingly, as part of the, our view that we are given of this future humanity, a sort of religion has developed based around the ancient past. Is that beginning to sound familiar? They have interestingly focused on uh, the religions built around certain aspects of the past that perhaps these future humans don't realize are connected with the technology that was their ancestors undoing and almost again the end of the species. And at one point we see a ritual going on and they're chanting, they're chanting. You're starting to listen to this and eventually, what are they chanting? What are they saying? Mission control, NASA. Mission control, NASA. So without knowing it, They've chosen to take aspects of ill-remembered, almost completely forgotten aspects of what was the pinnacle of their ancestors' technology, the space race, and make that the core of their religion, of their back to the earth religion. So it's a bit like in one of the Planet of the Apes uh, films where the future humans find themselves uh, worshipping nuclear weapons. Um, ironically enough, just knowing that they're powerful and significant, but not really understanding why. Okay, in considering this uh, crossover point in time, um, interdimensional travel, inevitably the, the idea of the Stargate came up. And we see a pyramid here. We could talk all day about the significance of pyramids uh, in terms of, of energy, um, of symbolism. And here with this Stargate image has everything here again. You've got circle, symbols, energy force, time, space, it's all here. This stuff keeps coming up again and again. These are the patterns that I'm suggesting that we look out for. Now, we hear a lot about folk horror. If ever there was a subgenre folk science fiction, if that ever existed, I think Sky might have been the first entry in that. But there wasn't anything like Sky before 1975, and I really don't think there's been anything like that since. Uh, just a quick honourable mention here for, this is the Druid Code, book by Thomas Sheridan. He and I did a, a very extensive interview uh, around this, which you can find at legalisefreedom.com. Uh, that was exists as both uh, audio and also as um, a, an article that you can read. There's excerpts you know, from the audio. And in this, we speak a great deal about megalithic sites as portals through time and space. So um, you might be interested in checking that out. Okay, so on to our next item. Uh, this is a show called Stones from 1976. Now, this is one episode in an anthology series uh, called The Mind Beyond, uh, which ran various years uh, throughout the decade. Uh, lots and lots of very interesting stories about all sorts of fascinating goings on in this world and beyond. This one, obviously, Stones referring to, as you can probably tell there by the uh, the image in the background to standing stones to megaliths. This is the mind beyond the sort of the the opening screen. Uh, something that came up in this episode that a uh, quote from someone that I just love. Um, you do not solve mysteries, 
you enter them. I would just say, just keep that in mind today. And indeed, the next time you encounter something that you do not understand. Now, the program was only ever broadcast once. It's never been shown again, and it's never been made available uh, on DVD, video, or anything like that. Uh, here are a few stills from it. You'll see uh, a time code in the top left-hand corner of each. The version that uh, you can find online is obviously some kind of studio bootleg that's been put out there in low quality, but nevertheless, uh, currently, at any rate, that is still available to watch. The story concerns a bid to by a tourism minister, the British government, to move Stonehenge, move the stones, the entire circle and the entire complex, in fact, from Salisbury Plain to Hyde Park in London in a bid to boost tourism. Now, that sounds absolutely ridiculous, and of course it is. I did a search for an image involving Stonehenge and Hyde Park, and this is what I came up with. Um, this is obviously not Stonehenge, and this is not Hyde Park in London, but the absurdity of what we're looking at here kind of sums up the absurdity of this tourism minister's plan. What we see here is not a bouncy castle, but actually a bouncy Stonehenge in the grounds of Hyde Park in Sydney in Australia. So this story is a classic clash of ancient and modern, the you know, old ways of thinking against ultra-scientific commercial ways of, of applying ideas in the modern world. And this comes up in these stories again and again. I, you know, this has been hinted at before, and you've seen this come out in some of these stories. It's this butting up of the eternal and the old ways with this new kid on the block, scientific, materialistic thinking. Uh, which again has been with us really as a species for a relatively short time, but it's come to dominate pretty much all of our thinking about pretty much everything. So the, tour the tourism minister begins to enact his plan. Wheels are in motion to get this going. And uh, one of the other main protagonists in the story is a um, academic who's uh, a, you know a megalithic expert. That's his passion, his research. And indeed, he's writing a book about Stonehenge at the time. Now, he he's very opposed to this plan, as you might imagine, and he starts to become more and more obsessed with the minister's plans and trying to uh, do what he can to prevent this from going forward. Equally, the minister, of course, is carrying a lot of power behind him of the establishment. And it looks like his plan is going to go ahead. It's only a question of logistics of how it can be done. Difficult enough, you might imagine. Now, what begins to happen, the story really begins to shift up a gear, is what begins to happen. Some of the things that begin to be experienced by the protagonists, by our megalithic expert, academic, and actually by his family and by some other people that he has yet to meet, but that they're all intimately connected with. Ancient defense mechanisms begin to be activated. This is what emerges as the tale unfolds. The threat to the stones seems to trigger something within human beings to help protect the stones. We need the stones. The stones need us. It's symbiotic, one energetic system. And so in his own way, the academic begins to do more and more you know, out of character things that his wife takes great exception to, in order to try and sabotage the politician's plans. Now, in the process, um, he's the owner of uh, a single volume of a three-volume set of very, very rare centuries-old books about megaliths, about Stonehenge. And he tries, he, he becomes obsessed with reuniting the set when handling his own volume of the set, he, for the first time, he accidentally uncovers a series of secret symbols hidden uh, in the spine of the book, uh, like a language, a coded language he has never seen before. He becomes obsessed with trying to decode that while simultaneously trying to find the other two volumes, uh, feeling that this must be significant in the events that are occurring. 
Remember also what I said earlier about books, about books going missing, books moving you know, from place to place mysteriously, and the content of books somehow changing, and books themselves as magical energetic entities in their own right. Simultaneously, the megalithic professor's daughter is beginning to enter trance states and have very strange dreams. She starts to draw what we would consider to be simplistic versions of triptychs, you know, megalithic stone arrangements. And she starts to cry out in her dreams, names of others, Shan and Pierre. Shan and Pierre. What does this mean? Now, it turns out the other two volumes of this three-volume set of rare books, uh, one is located in Wales, near a stone circle there, owned by a megalithic expert in that region. The other is located in Karnak in France, uh, near the megalith there, owned by a megalithic expert. So our England-bound academic realizes he has to try and get all of these together. The names that his daughter has been crying out, Shan is the daughter of the Welsh guy, and Pierre, the son of the French academic. So what happens is, and again, this I mentioned earlier about children's role in all of this and children's changing psyche as they develop and grow into adults. The children then become really the, the linchpins in our story. They end up appropriating the volumes of this book and they come together. They come together at Stonehenge and use the books themselves as part of a ritual to protect the stones. And as a result, this tourism minister comes to a sticky end. People who threaten the stones often meet this fate. Okay. And at the end of the story, the threat to the stones is neutralized. Now, at one point, a policeman is investigating what's been going on between these children and talk of telepathy and other psychic powers arises. And the policeman is, of course, uh, rational, materialistic, and he dismisses all of this. But our Welsh academic pipes up, no, officer, the old rational code is dying. We are less ordinary than we think. And a lot of people are finding that out and expanding their consciousness. That's another takeaway from this show. We are less ordinary than we think. You are less ordinary than you think. Here's another one I love from the show. Learned men came from elsewhere and built a stone language to speak to the gods, encapsulating what the megaliths represent. And I would say learned men came from elsewhen, from elsewhen. And here, again, a takeaway from this, this comes up in every one of these stories. Ultimately, if anyone tries to tell you that we know what these stones are for in all of their different formations, we do not know. Purpose unknown. We may never know what our ancestors knew. It may even be that they did what they did instinctively without fully understanding it but where we are now in our species history we simply do not understand maybe the future will bring that back to us this is a novelization of the series or one of them that was um, available at the time and there's a quote that i really like from the introduction uh, to this book that i think we can apply to all of these stories uh, the common theme of these stories is one as old as mankind. The need to explore what lies beyond the world of our normal and rational experience. Okay, so next item, Children of the Stones from 1977. Within this sphere, uh, this is actually you know, a very well-known TV series, once again aimed at children, at young adults. Like Sky, just loaded with concepts and ideas that would challenge a mind of any age, never mind a developing mind in a young person. One of the most striking things about Children of the Stones uh, for me is, is the use of sound, uh, the really eerie voices, the eerie 
music, if you can even call it that, that opens each episode. Uh, and it reminded me again of the connection between Megalith and Sound. Uh, if you're interested in, in any of that, um, check out the work of Paul Devereaux, because I do think that Sound at these sites is a very significant dimension of what they're about. We know there's all sorts of intriguing acoustic properties at Stonehenge, uh, never mind all these other sites that can be explored. A forebear of this may have been the cave paintings that we find, you know, pre-Ice Age in particular. There's research and evidence to suggest that the locations of the cave paintings within the caves mirror acoustically significant areas of those caverns, shall we say, and that the two are married. So sound and image come together. Also, with Children of the Stones, we have something that we see uh, in a another show we'll be coming to um, after this, where the opening of the first episode it has a sort of, again, a clash or a contrast between ancient and modern, as we see some of the protagonists driving past on a road, just driving past in a car. And in the background, we see some of the stones that play uh, a key role in the story. So here we see uh, Avebury from the air, uh, where the show is set and indeed where it was filmed and from this view we can see the significance of the the shape of the site and the symbolism thereof okay so our story concerns cycles of time in this case uh, four different cycles the village itself is set within a time rift uh, so the rules of time seem to be somehow warped within this, within the stone circle that encapsulates the village, such that a pattern of events that has been from history is repeating, trying to reach some kind of denouement or conclusion, failing to do so and therefore starting again, striving towards this end, not quite getting there, starting again. And as into one of these cycles, the fourth cycle, that we enter the story. Now, it turns out that in the distant past, at this location, a druid priest witnessed something. A megalithic supernova, an exploding star thousands and thousands of years ago. And he gleaned somehow with his insight that as a result of this, a black hole had been created. And... He again gleaned somehow, we don't know how or why, that the energy from this could be used to his advantage. And there was a connection between the earth and the heavens, the events in the heavens and events on earth, as above, so below. And so he, taking control of his, his environment, of the people, combines their anger and their fear to project energy out beyond the earth into the black hole, again, as a means of gaining control. Don't ask how, don't ask why. It's not revealed to us. We don't need to know. Now, in uh, one of the houses, button in the show, on the wall, we see a painting. Here's a, an image of it. And this encapsulates it all, really. Uh, we see the stone circle. Uh, we see the energy beam there uh, coming from the ground upward, could be the other way round. Uh, in the outer part of the circle, we see the Aruberos, uh, that cyclical time represented. We see people become stone here in the foreground and indeed in other parts of it, uh, of the circle. Uh, in the background, we even see a pyramid-shaped earth mound. So it's all here summed up in this image. Now, Cutting to the present day, as it is in the series, here we have Hendrik, master of the Happy Ones. Now, he is an astronomer, and he's come to, he made a discovery of the location of this ancient supernova and the resulting black hole. And as an astronomer, this has made him famous. So he's continued his research in this area and has moved to the local area. And he somehow, I think, is the modern incarnation of that ancient Druid priest. He comes sort of possessed by his spirit and seeks to continue his work. What Hendrik sets about doing is harnessing the power of the black hole. So kind of in reverse, harnessing the power of the black hole 
to beam it down to earth, again, to control the local environment, to control people. Again, why, how, we're not sure, we don't need to know. So from the black hole, down to the stones, into the psyche of the people under his control. Now, as the story pans out, of course, some of our protagonists move to stop Hendrik uh, for his nefarious schemes. And as a result, there is a catastrophic uh, destruction of the apparatus that he has constructed to uh, enact these plans. And almost everyone, apart from a few of our heroes, are transformed. And here we see into what? The children are the stones. The result of this energy transfer, people are turned into stone. Petrified, new stones for new stone circles are created. Cycles of time. We talked about this. This is what a key part of the story, and this comes up again and again in these tales. Cyclical time. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the way I see the cosmos is that there is no beginning and no end. I said before about time and space not being fundamental. There is no limit in space or time to reality. Within that, there are, of course, cycles of time. Time and space are within a greater whole. Okay, so on to our next item. This is Stigma from 1977. As you can see, this is part of the uh, BBC's adaptations of uh, ghost stories. Uh, this particular DVD also featuring the very famous uh, The Signalman by Charles Dickens. Here we see the opening screen from Stigma. That's uh, the overhead shot of the megalithic location. It's the old religion. Someone pipes up uh, when confronted by events uh, in this story. Once again, just referencing what I said earlier about it's this stuff that never, never quite goes away. People have assumed that it had. A lot of people wish it would. It's always with us. There's something eternal about it. It's the old religion. And stigma, as in Children of the Stones, we see in the opening of episode one, a couple of the protagonists in a car driving past the megalithic site that's soon to become central to the story. And again, there's this air of menace about the whole thing, an air of foreboding, shall we say. Now, this story concerns a family who've just moved into a new house in a rural location, once again, rural, uh, next to a stone circle, which is just in a field out the back of their house. One of these stones is lying on its side in what is now their back garden, on, you know, in, in the lawn. And the father of the house has decided he needs to get rid of this because uh, the house needs some work. And one thing he wants to do is landscape the garden. Got to get rid of the stone. So uh, some contractors are brought in to shift the thing. Uh, this raises a couple of questions, really. Uh, as we can see here, them with their lifting equipment. How did they do it? How were these megaliths quarried, moved, raised? Never mind why, just how did they do it? And the stone they're working with here is nothing. This is a pebble compared to some of the stones we see in megalithic sites around the world. Some, some of them in hundreds of tons. Here we see the mother of the house uh, in the kitchen, looking rather disturbed. And at the back there, you can see the stones in the field. Um, again, almost like there's a quality to them, I think, of life. You feel like you're being observed by these entities, whatever they are. Now, a key part of this story, as with uh, stones that we've just been talking about, is this idea of trouble befalling those who would disturb the stones. And when the workmen do manage to move the stone, in the back garden of this house, something clearly happens, something very strange, something supernatural. Some force is unleashed and it directly affects this woman in a very profound way. For a very short time, she appears completely spellbound, uh, but then she appears to recover from this and on we go with the story. But the message is clear. Just be very careful if you, when you disturb these sites. Be very careful about what your intentions are. 
towards the stones, whether you know, conscious or unconscious. I love this image. This is from when the workmen arrive. It's incredibly symbolic. Here we see her, and then we see the hook here from the crane, looking very much like a noose around her neck. Now, as the story begins to unfold, as the title suggests, stigma, the mother begins to bleed from various parts of her body. And I'm not talking about the usual orifices. Just the random parts of her body, she starts to bleed, and it gets progressively worse as the story unfolds. And eventually, she bleeds to death. She bleeds out so badly that she dies. And an interesting contrast for me in this show is between her and her daughter, both of whom are in the car in the aforementioned opening sequence. Now, I remembered um, her speaking to, saying something to her daughter as they drive along about her having just turned 13. Now, this is something that is purely an idea that occurred to me. There's nothing about it in the story itself. There's nothing really about it in any subtext. This is purely in my own mind. But we then see as her mother is slowly bleeding to death, we see the daughter walking around amongst the stones, looking very contemplative, looking very much at home. And in my mind, I start to draw a contrast between her mother's plight and menstrual blood in a young woman. And I don't know what, why that came up, but it just does. Her mother's bleeding to death and in great distress, and the daughter seems very much at peace. I have spoken earlier about the contrast between the psyche of children and young adults and those that are that of older adults. Now, another interesting wrinkle, again, that, that I immediately picked up on and I, I don't really understand. It doesn't seem to have any significance to the story. But at the beginning of the show, we see the mother in the kitchen preparing dinner. And the radio was on in the background. It's very clearly meant to be heard because she's in there on her own. So there's no dialogue. And the volume of the radio is such that it's very, very clear what's being said. So this was designed to be heard by the viewer. And the radio broadcast is talking about the then current Voyager missions to search for evidence of extraterrestrial life. Why is that there? Again, I do not know, but it has to be significant. It could have been football results. It could have been a traffic report. It could have been easy listening music. It could have been any of those things, but it wasn't. It was the Voyager mission. And here I have parked one of the Voyager modules at Stonehenge. There's something, again, there's a connection between the stones and what lies off Earth. I don't know what it is, but I think that we once understood it innately. Now, one of the concepts here in stones is the idea of psychometry. The idea that uh, stone events uh, particularly those that are emotionally charged, even violent, can somehow be recorded in their environment and then under certain conditions replayed later. And with psychometry, this idea expounded by T.C. Lethbridge, we see him here, uh, very much an Indiana Jones type character, a fascinating guy, uh, is this idea that this applies particularly uh, to stones. And in Stigma, I think the concept that there was some kind of violent or ritualistic murder or sacrifice, a death of some kind that took place in this area. And when that stone was disturbed, this event was somehow replayed and energetically, psychically affected the mother in this story to her detriment. And she died as a result. It may have been repeating the events of the past, how the person who died all those millennia ago, she is somehow reenacting that death. Now, I'll throw this in here, Stone Tape, 1972, um, a TV uh, movie written by Nigel Neal. We'll be talking about him again uh, shortly. Uh, this involves the same concept, the idea that past events, particularly those emotionally charged, can be recorded in the local environment, in this case, of course, stone, and then in future, under certain conditions, be replayed. Lethbridge's idea 
was that ghosts are not the spirits of the dead, but actually replays of these past events. And that's developed here in the stone tape. In fact, this, the title of this film lends itself to what's, you know, a, a, an actual proto-scientific concept known as stone tape theory that's trying to look at this scientifically and see if there could be anything to this. I mean, we know that uh, stones have the energy and that it, crystals in particular have uh, energetic qualities of, of all sorts that um, are well scientifically documented. So I think there is a, a sort of causal link here that makes this a fruitful area uh, for research. One other thing to mention in this context, The Keep, here a film from 1983 directed by Michael Mann, little known but well worth checking out. Now this is a kind of an occult Nazi sort of horror film set in World War II in Romania. Uh, a lot of the action takes place within a castle keep. Now, when we think of stone circles and henges, you know, the henge being the circular, most sometimes oval, but let's you know, circular earthwork around the stone circle. Not all henges have megaliths within them, but let's just think about the ones that do. Uh, what the normal arrangement is to have a ditch, uh, a mound, first of all, rather, and then a ditch on the inside. So you encounter an earth mound and then a ditch on the inside and then the stone stones within that now the having the ditch on the inside is defensively if you know useless because it'll be like having a moat on the inside of your castle so that can't be what it was for interestingly uh, stonehenge is the only such site in britain to have the ditch on the outside so if it were to be defensive that would make some sense there's no suggestion that suggesting that it is however but think about these sites in terms of energy if a moat was designed to be defensive, say, to keep something out, is having the ditch on the inside of the earthwork designed to keep something in? In the context of this film, the keep, this medieval keep of this castle, clearly de designed to repel invaders, if you watch the film, you'll see that it, it is designed to keep, <laughs> literally, a non-human entity, a force, a primordial force, to contain it within that area, to stop it getting out. So again, we're thinking about that in terms of megalithic sites and energy. Okay, so here we come to our next item, Raven from 1977. This is a British TV series uh, starring Phil Daniels of Quadrophenia fame. You can see him there at the top. Now, what this is really when looked at, when you sort of zoom out, look at the overall shape of this, it's the Arthurian mythos told in a modern setting. And Raven, let's say here once again, played by Phil Daniels, is a sort of a manifestation of King Arthur. The idea being introduced here is, is of Arthur as, not as, as an individual or a historical figure per se, who was alive for a while and then died, but as, a, as an archetype, as a recurring type of a, a human being that manifests at particular periods of time. Uh, it's always said in the, you know, in the Arthur story, the once and future kings, you know, Arthur will return when he is needed. Now, interestingly, this is, you know, Raven is called Raven. Um, and this is another parallel, similar wrinkle with the Arthur story, because he was found alone as a baby seemingly abandoned somewhere and taken into care and apparently when he was found there was a raven which appeared to be watching over him and would only fly away only left his side when he was rescued equally the the arc of raven's life being the short amount of his life that we're able to see here um it's basically it's the hero's journey of the joseph campbell variety raven is on a quest to find meaning in his life. Now, we're introduced to his character at the start of the story. He's a young lad who's been in trouble and he spent time in Borstal. This is basically a prison for young offenders, very rough places. And that's where he has come from. That's his background. In the TV show, he's sent to the country for a month to stay with an archeology span professor 
But the idea being that this will take him out of his previous environment, get him away from the Borso, get him out of the city, complete change of pace, complete change of environment. And on his road to rehabilitation, that this might be of some benefit to him. Now, as a lot of our characters in these stories do, um, we find in, in, in Raven here, the character and the story coming to be uh, coming to prominence at a time of significance on this planet, a time of sign efficacy. And once again, this is the idea that uh, when the time is right, well, when the, the figure is needed, you know, when Arthur is called for, then the king will come. Now, the professor that he goes to stay with, this chap here on the right, he knows. He has a sense uh, right from the off when he meets this young man of profundity around his destiny. And he knows that he is an incarnation of Arthur. And he steers Raven towards this realization in himself, helps him to understand uh, that he has a destiny and what that is. This is the milieu where the story takes place. The professor has been given a limited amount of time to do research in a cave network. Uh, here you see the porter cabin being used by um, some workers next to a stone circle, which sits above the cave network. The plan, and here we have ancient and modern clashing once again, the plan is to use the cave network to store nuclear waste. It's just going to be a waste dump. And so as with a lot of archaeology projects, you know, th those that are centered around building or construction or anything like this, they're given the archaeologists are allowed in for a very short time to do their research before uh, commercial interests um, hold sway. The, meth the message coming out of this again is linked to the Arthurian mythos because it's, it's about environmental degradation. And, and in, in this King Arthur story, the land is wasted at one point. The land is wasted and the king himself wastes away. Arthur wastes away the land and the king are one. The land and the grail are one. The grail there is a suggestion in some research around the Arthur's, um, Arthurian mythos that the Grail was actually a form of technology involving stone. A uh, recent book by John Michael Greer bears this out. You can find an extensive show about this at legalizefreedom.com. The land and the Grail are one. So the professor feels that this cave ne network is very, very significant, and not only just as you know for uh, archaeological reasons. He feels that it may be this Arthur's gateway through time, that the Arthurian archetype has manifested, literally made its way into our time through this, somehow through this cave network, Arthur's gateway through time. Now here we see the control room for the, the people who are uh, you know, planning to have this as a nuclear waste dump. And one of the things that they decide they're going to do is join up some of the separate caverns in this cave network, 12 separate caverns. Now, it is decided at some point, they're just going to go ahead and do drilling, but the observation is made by the professor or is, um, one of the other characters who are opposed to this plan, I can't quite recall which, um, who say, well, these 12 caverns appear to be related to astrological signs, astrological energies, and the one cavern that you're intending to drill from into another one, these are opposing energies. And if you go ahead and join them up like this, there may be trouble. And of course, there is, uh, there is a, uh, a cave collapse. And it is only through um, the ingenuity um, of the professor and Raven that the situation is rescued. Now, eventually there is, spoiler alert, there is a, a happy ending of, of sorts in that the project to dump the nuclear waste does not go ahead. I would say in this show, Raven, um, these are the threads that we draw out, archeology, span astrology, and archetypes. They're what we take away from this in terms of dominant themes. Uh, this is the novelization. Raven himself, the character, goes on to, in, in some ways, it's like, the, again, like the Arthurian mythos. Um, Raven has his moment, but at the end of the show, he's seen as facing an uncertain future, whereas the other characters on whatever side seem to have uh, definite steps ahead of them, you know, where they're going, what comes next. But Raven is kind of left a little bit um, without a purpose at that point. He's seeking another quest, and, uh, and that's really where the series is left. But um, 
packed full of ideas, again, aimed at young adults, quite remarkable. Uh, Raven, 1977. Next item, Doctor Who was inevitable. This would make an appearance, really. The, the show, uh, Stones of Blood, or The Stones of Blood, 1978. Now, once again, this is taking place, the events are taking place at a time of significance, a time of significance on this planet. The uh, series was filmed at the Rollwright Stones. So there's more than one uh, complex there, or sorry, there's more than one collection of stones, set of stones at that the Rollwright complex, but here we see a shot of the main uh, circle. This is the one that's claimed that you cannot count. Basically, you go round once, you count the stones round to where you started, and then you go round again, count them, and you end up with a different number. Not put that one to the test myself. Now, the doctor's been called in to investigate some deaths, some mysterious uh, deaths in uh, shadowy circumstances, and he runs into a local druid um, cult, for want of a better word. Um, there's a local chap who's leading that. But he also encounters this character, and she's very mysterious. I mean, is, is she all that she appears to be, or is she more than she appears to be? Is she really much older than she appears to be? And pretty quickly, we start putting things together, with it being Doctor Who, obviously, we find an off-world connection. And this is where the ancient alien idea comes in again. Is this lady actually a creature millennia old from some other part of the uh, galaxy? Blood from stone is the old axiom, uh, difficult to get. Uh, this story uh, hinges around blood into stone. This is playing on the idea earlier, you know, we talked about the sort of uh, stones and malign influence. And this, this story plays into the idea of uh, stone circles being, you know, sacrificial sites. And again, whatever you think about that idea, it's still a popular trope um, in these sorts of things. So the stones in the story here, as is indicated in the title, they are activated by blood sacrifice. A couple of interesting things come into play here. Um, the stones, there you can see two of them in the background. They in they are from another planet, the planet Ogros, and the stones themselves, these these beings, these creatures are called the Augury. Now, when I first was watching this, obviously there was nothing written down. I was listening to dialogue. And uh, someone says, uh, they are the Augury. And I heard it, of course, as Augury on the right there. And I thought that was interesting, uh, an interesting little wrinkle. Uh, what is an Augury, after all, but a sign of something that may happen in the future? So this ancient alien or druidic priestess or whatever she is or whatever it is, is in control of the, the Augury and uh, the mayhem that they're wreaking uh, on Earth. So the Doctor, long story short, has to come up with a plan. He does come up with a technological fix to uh, take care of this. But, I mean, how to kill a stone? That's what the problem he was facing at first. If these stones are, in fact, alive in some sense, you know, and if they're not alive in a conventional sense, then how do we kill them? How do we stop them? So the Doctor, of course, as I said, comes up with a plan and amongst, um, as well as being able to stop the stones, in what they're doing, they're killing spree. He also deals with the ancient alien druid priestess. And how does he do that? You guessed it, turns her to stone. She becomes a new member of a stone circle. Now, just before we move on, I just want to throw in a quick mention of this. The Change is from 1975, one of the best series of its type, uh, because this idea we've been talking about with uh, you know intelligent stones or stones that are somehow alive is found in this uh, story here as well. In the changes, it is a sentient lodestone, a lodestone that is conscious, that enacts changes in the human psyche, the psyche of our entire species, in order to affect our behaviour. Uh, we're seen in the changes as bringing about our downfall through the misuse of technology. And it is the influence of the sentient lodestone which comes alive, as it's where it comes to life at the time it is needed, and it changes human consciousness uh, at a completely different direction for our societies. Okay, so on to our next item. Here we have the Quatermass Conclusion from 19. 
79. This is the fourth of the major equator mass story cycles. Uh, this is also known simply as Quater Mass or Quater Mass 4. And this was a, a television series, uh, but also um, there's a film cut of it as well, which was released uh, in cinemas. Uh, if you don't know anything whatsoever about the character of Bernard Quatermass or the things that he um, finds himself tangled up in, I can thoroughly recommend it. If you like any of the material we've been talking about so far, I think there's a lot to interest you um, here. So this is the milieu that Quatermass finds himself in um, at the start of our story. In the last quarter of the 20th century, the whole world seemed to sicken. Civilized institutions, whether old or new, fell, as if some primal disorder was reasserting itself. Primal disorder. Remember what I said earlier about primordial forces. Now, of course, this little paragraph sounds, you could say, you could argue, sounds a lot like where we are at the moment. So, but to be quite honest with you, in my lifetime anyway, the last quarter of the 20th century and now close to being the first quarter of the 21st has felt like one long slow motion collapse. So yeah, the professor finds himself amid societal breakdown, economic, social, political, things are coming undone fast. But he still has work to do. Now he's called in to investigate a couple of things actually. One is the destruction, the mysterious destruction of two spacecraft by a mysterious energy being uh, whose origin is so far out in space that, that its route cannot be determined. They cannot tell exactly where this is coming from. But it's a direct targeted beam that takes out these two spacecraft. And it almost seems like a bit of a warning. You know, this is not for you. You stay down on your planet. So he's doing that. And these, as it emerges, seem to be somehow connected with the other thing that he's looking into. And that is the mysterious disappearance of groups of young people. Uh, now, here we see him at one of these stone circles where one of these disappearances has taken place. And these young people are gathering at uh, sites, of, sort of places of gathering, we should say. So we've got ancient sites like the stone circles, places of energetic significance, but also places like football stadiums, you know, sports stadiums, because those are areas, places that um, thousands of people gather together. And we all know about the collective energy, good and bad, when you get crowds together. Now, if you look around in this scene, the white dust spread ev spread everywhere will give you a rather gruesome clue as to what has happened to this particular group of young people. Now, the group of young people uh, we're talking about here, groups rather, I should say, uh, here, here's one of them, and they are known as the planet people. Yeah, they're a sort of eco-activists, as it were. Well, they're not really active, but anyway, they're, they're concerned about the direction of travel in society, and they want nothing to do with it. They're a very typical hippie like sort of they represent a rejection of the establishment of the status quo uh, we see the central character there in the middle that's kick along basically this is extinction rebellion before the fact these people want to tear down the society that they're part of the society that brought them up and gave them whatever it is they have without any plan in place to replace it and of course like extinction rebellion and just stop oil and others uh, the planet people not averse to resorting to violence if and when it suits them. This is what they're after. Now, in gathering at these megalithic sites and indeed at stadiums and whatnot, they believe, don't ask me how or why, that they're going to be raptured uh, to a better life on another planet. The, the Earth is done for. Spaceship Earth is finished. And they, as I say, somehow imagine that they're going to be maybe in one of those energy beams, going to be taken up, um, into you know to another a new Earth uh, to start over again uh, doesn't quite work out like that. Let's put it that way. Now, uh, in passing, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, a video that I made during the C nineteen the pandemic period. Uh, this is a thumbnail from the video. You can find it at legalizefreedom.com, also on YouTube, Legalize Freedom One. Are humans being harvested? And you can see I've used the image earlier on from, from Quatermass. 
I felt at that time that because of what was happening with the pandemic, that there had to be some kind of non-human influence in all of that. I couldn't believe that actual human beings would do this to each other. And I felt that like human beings were being harvested for their energy, negative energy. They were, be we were being programmed in a certain way to respond in a certain way. And then that energy was being harvested and still developing my ideas about how or why. Uh, but I'd like to refer you to that video. Now, the idea is presented, and this is a key one here in the Creator Mass Conclusion, that there is an off-world alien force that is, again, harvesting the energy of, in particular, these young people, the planet people, and that they're drawn to certain sites. Here, for example, you see, you know, a megalithic uh, stone circle because of some kind of energetic force that is there. They feel compelled to, to go there. The concept is that whatever alien force is enacting this plan thousands of years ago, maybe even millions of years ago, laid something underneath these sites. And the sites themselves were, that they didn't even exist at the time that this alien technology was put on Earth, but these sites were then later chosen by, by humans who sensed something important about the sites. And what they were sensing was the energy of whatever was implanted in the Earth. So the force was here before the stones. Whatever energetic center these stones group around, there was a force there beforehand. And suggesting equator mass is its off world. Here we see the research facility that um, Professor Quater Mass and his colleagues have been using to try and one of the things to try to figure out what is going on and where this is coming from. Ultimately, uh, the professor rigs up um, a device to um, destroy the connection uh, with the off, you know, the alien off-world influence and whatever is embedded in the earth and he uses a nuclear weapon to do that the question of course is left hanging at the end of it all um is that has that link been broken forever or will human beings have to face alien intervention again at some point in future alien intervention does not have our best interests at heart before we leave this one a nod to nigel neil the writer a creator of quater mass and uh so many other wonderful stories and it, it seems to me that um a lot of his writing and particularly in the quater mass stories is about a tension between young people and the older generation hippie rebels and a kind of you know establishment status quo that i mentioned earlier and in his writing you do get the feeling that he's pessimistic about our human future and um i think nowhere is that more pronounced than in the quater mass conclusion Okay, final item for today, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch from 1982. is the third in the Halloween cycle of movies, though of course nothing to do with the first two. Halloween itself was a pioneering slasher film, you know, it really created the genre. And Halloween 2 was basically a, a, an inferior rerun of the first one. The idea behind this, behind Halloween 3, and even though uh, John Carpenter, director of Halloween and creator of it, didn't direct this film, he did have a, you know, behind the scenes influence. The idea was that Halloween would become uh, like an anthology series of films. So each one would be set at Halloween, but the story could be a little thing onto itself. And certainly there, it wouldn't be just a, a series of slasher films, which is, which is what it turned into. Relatively poor box office for this film meant that that never really happened, but that was the idea. Now, here is one of the main protagonists in the whole story, Conal Cochran, an Irish industrialist uh, who's moved at some point from Ireland to California. I do love a good joke, and this is the best ever, a joke on the children. Something he says it was at one point. Now his business is in making novelties, in this case Halloween novelties, whether he does novelties for other times of the year, <laughs> I'm not sure. But yeah, you can tell just by looking at this guy, there's more going on here than a guy who makes scary masks for kids to go out trick-or-treating. So as the film unfolds, we begin to find out what this guy is really about. What What's he doing all this for? And here we have it. It was the start of the year in our old Celtic lands, and we were waiting in our houses of wattles and clay. 
the barriers would be down, you see, between the real and the unreal. And the dead might be looking in to sit by our fires of turf. Halloween, the festival of Samhain. The last great one took place 3,000 years ago, and the hills ran red with the blood of animals and children. It's time again. So, Cochrane's plan is to reenact, to reinvigorate, to bring back the true purpose and meaning of Halloween as he sees it, mass sacrifice. Okay, and how is he going to do it? Okay, well, first item, here we see his selection of masks, three different types that you can get. Now, each one of these, as it turns out, is impregnated, it has within it embedded a small shard of one of the sta standing stones, one of the stones from Stonehenge, one of the blue stones, maybe I can't quite recall. And that the energy within that stone is going to come into play in what these masks are really designed to do. Now, bear in mind, his factory is in California, in the fictional town of Santa Mira. So how on earth is he chipping bits off Stonehenge? Well, he actually hauled one of the entire things, the stones all the way uh, from Salisbury Plain to the west coast of the US. Oh, we had a time getting it here. You wouldn't believe how we did it, he says. Now, this is my photograph of Rudston Monolith. So any pedants out there, I understand this is not Stonehenge, but it suits the purpose. So yeah, they somehow got one of these stones all the way uh, over to America. The, you see his minions in the factory chipping away at the stone, a uh, little bit, little shard, uh, each one to go into each of the Halloween masks. Now here's Cochrane again reflecting on the technology that his factory runs on. Advanced and ancient technology, he says. Now, we don't see those as two different things. The ancient technology is advanced and the advanced technology is ancient. It has a power in it, a force. This is when he's talking about the stones. This is what the, one of the key messages of, of everything I'm saying here today. These things have power, energy, force. Don't ask me how, why, what, but it's there. You can sense it. You've ever been close to any of these things. Now, speaking of advanced and ancient technology, here are Cochrane's enforcers, uh, androids that he has designed. These are the cutting edge of technology. I mean, nothing like this exists now that we know of, uh, but these are cutting edge technology, but powered by ancient knowledge, ancient energies, primordial forces. So how is this plan going to be enacted? Well, it's going to be through television. Here we see a young kid with his Halloween mask on and in the background, TV playing one of the Silver Shamrock, that's Cochrane's company, one of the adverts. And the advert is going to go out across all networks at a set at the identical time on Halloween and it will activate the stone chips within the masks and bloody mayhem will ensue. Uh, we can see here, it's almost time, kids. The clock is ticking. Remember the big giveaway at nine. Don't miss it and don't forget to wear your masks. The clock is ticking. It's almost time. Don't miss it and don't forget to wear your masks. The clock is ticking. It's almost time. Now, does the plan succeed? Watch it and find out. This is Chalice, a doctor, one of the main characters. He uncovers Cochrane's plan and does whatever he can to try and stop it. This is him on the phone to TV networks, trying to get them to stop the broadcast of the advert. Does he succeed? So television is the delivery device for the evil energy in Halloween 3. Uh, I spoke earlier, and Nigel Neal, by the way, uh, worked on the script for Halloween 3 and developed some of the ideas. And in the Quatermass conclusion, uh, he portrays a society, uh, aside from falling apart at the seams, as um, dumbed down uh, on dumb television programs, uh, lowest common denominator. And this is how I see it. Liquid crystal display, lowest common denominator. Everything is okay, ladies and gentlemen. Everything is okay. So as we draw to a conclusion today, I just want to, I feel all of this leaves us with 
some questions that we might like to take away and ponder. Is this progress? Maybe. Is this civilization? After everything we've been through, millions of years, the, the times that we've come close to being wiped out, that I mentioned earlier, this species brought almost to the brink of extinction more than once. And after all that, everything that we've survived, everything we've endured, everything we've achieved, for this? But we should choose a new path for our civilization, if there is to be one, consciously. There is a danger we will sleepwalk into this. And that's what we must guard against. But one thing I'll leave you with is that no matter what happens, in the end, the ancestors will awaken, the earth will abide, the power remains. Thank you for your attention.